right, thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm now joined uh, to discuss our professional indemnity segment uh, by Malcolm Padiachi, who's the business head of liability, PI, and single projects, although we'll be focusing a lot on single projects and PI. Welcome, Malcolm. Thank you, Simon. And then, of course, I'm joined by my co-host for the rest of the program today, Anton Mayer, who's our business head of claims, um, which is, of course, where we ultimately get to demonstrate the value of the products that we provide. So welcome back, Anton. Thank you, Simon. All right, let's move through this. So, so we've split this segment into, into two areas, um, our professional indemnity, um, which is where we're dealing with most of our traditional professions. Uh, and then we're going to look at the single project elements uh, a little bit after that. Um, so when we're looking at uh, 2019, um, we haven't quite gotten back up to, to the levels we were at. Incidentally, uh, to, to the viewers, these are intimated claims. I um, mean, there is a difference between intimated um, and incurred claims. That is ultimately the value that we could be liable for based on the summons uh, and information that we've received on these uh, third-party claims. And then on the right-hand side, you've got the claims volume. So that's the number of new claims that were registered in each year. And you can see 2021 just kind of starting to, to move uh, upwards. Um, Anton, uh, why did we decide to start showing intimated claims rather than just sticking with incurred? on these things? Simon, it ties in with the long tail nature of these matters. And I think the concern is, you know, if, if we go, you know, 2013, for instance, if we look at 2013, the intimated claim was there. It showed those two claims. Right. But what actually happened was in the reserves and everything else, it got the incurred number. Would the the much incurred lower. number is because you don't know what's going on. Sure. You don't know when you're going to get the information. Sometimes it takes two, three years, as Gareth said, before you even have the information, let alone know where you're going to go with a claim. So we use that as a barometer just to show what is going on or as a little image of what's going on in the market. So we're just trying to show what is out there and that it's not zero for three years and then all of a sudden it spikes because when we do the, the next survey, um, you know, it's not going to show how things have evolved. You know, it shows in financials, but yes. it's a far better barometer just to show what is going out there, sure. what type of cases are floating around. Sure. Malcolm, did that surprise you, seeing those numbers? Um, no, not at all, because, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of factors that affected specifically on the claims volume side of things. Um, prior to 2020, um, you know, we had to, we embarked on an exercise um, that required us to uh, re-underwrite our book of PI business, because that part of the business has been the most distressed business in the entire SHA portfolio. Um, as like a frequency of severity losses. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so that required us to de-risk our portfolio, in which we had to exit certain classes of PI business, and that resulted in a loss in policy count. Um, so Sorry, I just want to stop you there. Yeah. I mean, exiting a profession would, that would surely be a last resort. Um, we, we would sort of try to take some corrective action, um, but if there's a cheaper market out there, then... I mean, ab absolutely, absolutely. And that's what we've done. Is we've taken aggressive corrective action in re-underwriting um, certain classes of PI uh, business um, so that it's performing at, at acceptable levels. But as you say, you know, in, in the competitive market out there, um, you know, we still... Someone Lost might a lot be prepared to take account. that business on because they haven't had the loss history Correct. that we've had on that particular Even profession. distressed risks have been taken on by, by competitors at significantly cheaper, cheaper premiums than ours. Yeah, someone said it's kind of like just kicking a can down the road. You know, you, you are going to have to pick it up eventually. Um, so you might get three or four good years before the tail comes around. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the long-tailed nature of, of, of PI business, which Garib's alluded to as well. And we started to see that, I mean, in, in, in 2020, building up to 2020, coupled with you know, the shutdown of businesses uh, due to COVID, um, we saw fewer claims being noted as a result of being exposed to fewer policies as a result of our cleaning out of our PI business. But in 2021, you can see those numbers started to normalize as businesses got back together, you know, work continued, and we started to see, see claims come through. Yeah, it's almost back to sort of, let's say, pre-pandemic or someone said BC, you know, before COVID. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, 
Absolutely. We're starting to see, we're starting to see that trend. I, I know that there were some professions that didn't display this trend where the number of claims continue to rise, and I, and I think we'll get to those yeah. um, in a moment. Uh, I just want to move on to single projects. Um, uh, uh, some of our viewers might not be aware of what this kind of insurance is all about, Malcolm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just give us a sort of bird's eye view of that? Yeah, I mean, so maybe just speaking about, you know, these claims numbers in initially, is that the construction industry in South Africa has been in a depressed state now for, for quite a few years, as there's a severe lack of government projects to stimulate, you know. Oh, so these like the, the infrastructure-based? Kind of large generally. infrastructure project. I mean, just last week, Sundral announced cancellation of 17 billion rand worth of roads, tenders, wow. due to flaws in the tender process. I mean, this has massive impact on, um, sure. you know, the, the businesses the that, industry, that, yeah. that, and industry that, that rely on this work. As a result of that, you know, we're seeing a significant decline in demand for single project PI policies. And those numbers may be a bit misleading, you know, it shows low frequency, but in fact, there's just an absence of demand for single project PI policies. You know, single project PI policies, as you know, are multi-year policies covering multiple um, insureds, and those policies are alive to up to 10 years um, in, in terms of local insurers' um, 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 uh, treaties. And what we're seeing now is that due to the lack of demand for new SPPI policies, we're starting to see claims come through from older policies, and, and that's reflective of the stats coming through. So we, we've got the, the older claims coming through now and no, no, not, a, not a lot of great new business coming in to, to kind of top up the float at, at, at the front end. Correct. Correct, John. Most of the 25 uh, new notifications actually refer to periods probably about four or five years ago. So it's, it's not new claims coming through now, it's, it's all the historic stuff, as you said, yeah. long tail or long period policies, but they still remain active. So th th that's the bulk mm. of, of the claims that came in. Yeah, and just adding on to, to the long tail nature of PI uh, claims, you know, our historical data showed that um, it used to uh, develop in cycles of five years, but our recent data shows that this tail has extended, as Gareth alluded to as well, to up to seven to eight years. And there's a very various factors that affect that. You know, it's, it's the arduous litigation process that we're exposed to, um, legal strategies employed by attorneys um, on matters, um, you know, the absence of, or, 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 or the availability of experts and witnesses, and the general cost of PI claims. We've had situations where um, clients experience what we call litigation fatigue and lose interest in pursuing and that, a matter that, that's that, in litigation. That, a, that, that could be a strategy. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That could be a strategy, which you know, uh, contributes to the factors of, of, of the long-tailed increasing then when it's, over time. When it ultimately gets settled, of course, now you're dealing with, you know, in the, in the case of that 2013 claim that Gareth was talking about, you've, mm. you've got all the inflationary pressures, money's kind of halved its value in that seven-year period. Yeah. So, yeah, one, one can see how that could get quite complicated to price as well, because you, you're having to price for that today. Absolutely. And, and that being said, is that, you know, although these numbers look low, um, what we have found is that when a claim is notified under the SPPI policy, it's a fairly large claim because we have large limits assigned to these policies, and that's the nature of it, you know. The reason why clients procure SPPI policies is to access these higher limits of indemnity. Sure. Okay, that's scary. All right, so let's, let's move into averages. So, so in, the, in the PI area, uh, I mean, the graph looks like it drops much more than it does, mm. but, but 20, 2019, um, we saw the average claim go from 3.7 million to, to 3.3 million. Um, I mean, it, it has dipped. Is, 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 that, is that expected? Is that also related to COVID? So, so I mean, as you can see, there's, it's not a massive dip on the PI side of things. Um, yeah. And it's consistent with the de-risking of our portfolio, sure. where we've lost a large number in policy count, exposing us thus to, uh, yes. you know, a lower number of claims being notified. And that lower number of claims affects the averages of these PI claims noted in the slide here. I wonder if, Anton, uh, we were just talking now about that sort of glut of claims that are stuck in the court system. Mm -hmm. so, so during that sort of go slow because of, of the lockdowns, nothing was going through the court system, which, which could indicate that there were no legal fees being incurred in, in that period of time either, that we might still see that coming through the pipeline. So, so 2021 could actually look quite different. 
Oh yes. Um, you know, once we once we go through the the, the, the final numbers yes. in, in a couple of years' time. Yeah, no, no, 100%, Simon. I think, uh, once again, because of the long tail nature, you, you always see a sort of a dip towards the end of the year that's so close. I mean, mm. uh, we've already incurred costs pertaining to the 2021, 2020, and 2019 years so far this year. Yeah. So if, if you have to take it as at today, the figures will already have changed. Right. Um, and lots of the uh, costs that the guys incur, you know, absolutely spike in the beginning when they prepare for everything, then it sort of dulls down a little bit while you're waiting for trial, and then, of course, it goes through the roof. Just before Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Not always, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> you have these spikes throughout the I, year. I do, I do yeah. find it interesting, though, that, um, I mean, if I look in our SME portfolio, there's, we still have a lot of clients that buy what could possibly just be a statutory limit of indemnity. They've been told to have a million. Now, if you're buying a million of PI cover, but the average is actually 3.3 .3 million, um, that, I mean, that, that you're going to land up with an absolute disaster um, when, when the first claim comes through. Yeah, 100%, 100%. Look, you know, you can never tell anyone what type of limit to buy because, you know, you <laughs> say 20 million and then the claim is 50 million. Yeah, whatever so, you can afford. But, is the... uh, but at the end of the day, mm. um, you know, at those averages, you know, a million rand, it's, especially if it's contractual mm. um, or, or statutory like, like uh, in, in certain other areas, it's, it's certainly not enough. That's the B, B minimum that, uh, you know, an industry body would look at and say, let's, let's peg it, yeah. That's your starting yeah. point. Yeah. I mean, a million rand can be expunged just purely by defense costs, defending yes. the insured yes. in a potential claim, you know, leaving, thus leaving him exposed to indemnity if, you know, if he is found liable. Sure. Um, so it's a massive risk that... Yeah, and also the complexity plays into that. I mean, we chatted about it the other day. We had one bill from one attorney for a period of about three months, but highly complex matter of about mm -hmm. five million rand. Yeah. In yeah. a couple of but months. Like being billed for more hours than they are in the day. Was the guy dreaming about the case no, as well? Then you got the, billed for that. The sad part is the specialists. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have your, right, your, your a team of uh, there's a whole team, team of people. people. So you know, and, and, and trust me, we scrutinise these things. Mm. But I mean, you know, when when you look at this and the complexity that's involved in some of these claims, yeah. you know, you don't have a choice. Mm. You can't just run in and, and think you're going to just argue it. Absolutely. You know, specialist engineers aren't cheap. You know. Oh. Let's, let's, talking of engineers, I mean, let's, let's look at that, that single project environment. I, I guess the mm. average is, is easily swayed up or down because of the low mm. number of claims. Yeah. Um, any comments there, Miles? So, so I've mentioned earlier on that you know, PI was the most distressed book of business in the SHA portfolio, and single projects contributed largely to that as well. Um, coupled with you know, the depressed economy um, and, and, and the decline of, of large infrastructure projects, we saw fewer risks, or, or we saw a, a, a few, uh, decline in demand for single project policies, um, as a result of which we secured, mm -hmm. you know, fewer policies. And that's impacted that, um, you know, those figures are declining as well. The other factor that contributed to this was due to the adverse claims that we've experienced in the single project PI policy, we curtailed our appetite drastically uh, in respect of single projects. Um, we reduced capacity in the market, we increased rates, increased deductibles, and tightened up our wording um, to manage our risk to acceptable levels. Um, as a result of which, you know, we saw, we saw fewer opportunities. Yeah, I mean, you've got to keep it sustainable. Ab yeah. Absolutely. And, th and that's the reason why it, 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 um, it, it reduced to those numbers. But having said that, you know, the market in general has reduced the appetite for single project policies. You know, according to my knowledge, there's just only one other market except for SHA that expresses an appetite to underwrite single project uh, PI policies locally. And, and, I mean, globally, is, is this a trend? Is this high-risk business everywhere? This is not unique to SA. Absolutely. Uh, globally, single project PI policies is almost not available. Okay. And when it is available, it's extraordinarily expensive, sure. um, making it unaffordable for clients. So it is absolutely a global problem. What's the alternative, though, um, to, to taking out a single, each professional just takes out their own cover? Correct. I mean, that's, that's the trend that okay. we're seeing following our reduced capacity in the market and appetite, is that clients are pushing the risk down to um, the respective professionals and contractors executing the projects. But the risk there is 
or lies there is that if the contractor or the professional fails to comply with these policy conditions or fails to pay his premium, the ultimate client mm. ends up being unprotected should there be a claim arising out of these professionals' mm. uh, responsibilities. Whereas with a single project, the client has the comfort of controlling the insurances from, from a sure. principal point of view. Yeah, makes sense. But Simon, just, just for, for your interest, um, if we had a year to date 2022 on that slide, uh, it would have gone up. Okay. Given it's, what's happened on some of the matters so far. quite rapidly. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, let's, let's look at some of the professions that bucked the trend. Um, so, uh, you know, going from 2019 to 2021, uh, there, there were more than, than just these two. I, I, I picked on them, um, I think, ironically, <laughs> yeah. because of the, the legal profession being in there. But the number of claims actually went up. So this is not the, the quantum. Um, this is the it's number of actual mm. claims incidents um, went up by 33% between 2019. So something was happening in, in lockdown in, in the legal fraternity. Um, and, and then the accountants, um, mm. that, that went up by 122%. Um, why? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, it is surprising that it seems though that the legal profession and the accounting profession have been extremely busy during COVID, I guess, apart from medical professionals. With a and bunch of lawyers suing accountants, it seems, <laughs> and then vice versa. Vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the claims that contributed to the legal profession, that 33%, uh, largely attributed to crime-type claims, where attorneys um, were, um, where employees of attorneys were misappropriating monies okay. from trust accounts, and uh, also impersonation fraud via email scams okay. um, is the other trend that we've picked up. Now, despite... Um, um, the awareness created by the media, social media, um, the relative, uh, the respective legal practice councils, attorneys are still falling victim to mm. impersonation fraud, cybercrime events, mm. um, and 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 this is the trend that we that we're seeing that's influenced that that 33 percent. Okay. On the accounting side, um, similar issues arose, impersonation fraud, especially in accountants that provide so payroll trust services. Trusts. Services, yeah. Payroll services, company yeah. secretarial, trust yeah. services, where they have access to their clients' accounts and make payments out of those business accounts. And they're falling victim to email scams as well uh, saw, in terms of impersonation. I saw a few for, in, the, in the list, um, in, in fact, quite a few um, tax-related tax issues. So, mm -hmm. you know, either not submitting tax returns on, on time or, or getting the numbers wrong. Yeah. That, and that's, that's the other trend, yeah. is that accountants failing to timelessly file their clients' tax returns, uh, which result in SARS imposing fines or penalties on their clients. And then they hold the accountant liable. So based on negligence. Based on your negligence. And then the other factor that, that contributed to that was, I mean, there's, there's a sharp focus on auditors in the media, as, as, as you all read, yeah. where auditors are alleged um, 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 to incur PI claims as a result of failing to pick up mismanagement in companies they audit or fraud in companies they audit, right. um, resulting in claims against, against auditors. So those are the, the three more important trends that we're seeing that contribute to that 122% increase. I, I, didn't, I didn't put it up on the screen, but, but the, the sort of in third place behind these two, we had uh, architects, which is mm. about a 17% movement in, in claims upwards. Yeah. Um, wh why would that be? So yeah, I mean, architects, are trending in the same vein as engineers recently. Because uh, what we're finding is that clients are not wanting to appoint different professionals on a project, have a separate contract with an engineer, separate contract with the architect, and a separate contract with the QS. They're tending to appoint architects as a principal agent, um, and thereby passing over the risk to employ all these professionals right, under so under the under the project of. management principal architect type and, and that that is actually something that we commented on in in the last risk review. So yeah. it's 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 definitely a trend. It's that, trend that we've seen yeah. continuing. And clients are holding these architects to account when something goes wrong inside, as opposed sure. to previously, if it was an engineer's fault, the client would go after the engineer yes. or the QS. Now it just goes over the 
goes yeah. for the architect, and the architect has to respond to that. And you, he has yeah. to figure out well, who's liable in the background Correct. if he wants to. Yeah, with the additional uh, problem that we're facing there as well that also triggers some of these claims is, uh, like Malcolm was saying, you know, the, the construction industry as a whole has been under pressure for, for a couple of years. So in lots of times, you know, you'll find that the architect's the only man standing mm. after the contractor, you know, goes into business rescue or, mm. you know, eventually ends up liquidated. So that also contributes to the deeper, uh, the deeper pockets. In Correct. That. And it is, it is quite risky because I know some of the ones that I've seen, the architects don't buy as much cover as the engineers do mm. uh, in, in many instances. Um, so, you know, they could be left with a, a chunky claim and, and not enough cover in place, particularly in the smaller businesses. Yo, uh, when, when I started in PI quite a number of years ago, I'm not going to say how many, um, the average limit was about a million rand. And I don't think that's increased substantially, yeah. you know, not, not, not yeah, in relation to where, where things have gone. Yeah. No, that doubt hasn't moved yeah. substantially at all. Okay, I just want to touch on this briefly. Um, we, we don't have a, a significant um, portfolio of, of broker PI um, at, at SHA. In our survey that brokers took part in, um, we asked them, have you had any incidents um, reported to you that could be potential PI claims? So it's not necessarily actual PI claims. Um, and 16% and of brokers said that they thought they might have some claims related to the contingent business interruption following the pandemic. 14% um, said um, they might have some exposure following the SASRIA riots. Uh, and 5% said that they'd had some issues where their clients had suffered cyber attacks and there wasn't any cyber insurance in place. Um, Malcolm, can you just kind of talk to this? Yeah, I mean, I mean Garrett mentioned, spoke about systemic events, and these typical systemic events have brought brokers into sharp focus in the media recently, um, where allegations are being made against brokers in that they fail to provide adequate advice or procure the ad adequate cover to cover these systemic type events. And what we've seen as well is that the courts tend to favor um, more public um, uh, favored interpretations on contracts, thus creating greater onus on brokers um, to ensure that the level of advice they're giving clients um, is correct. It's rather unfortunate because you know, brokers are essentially expected to have a crystal ball to tell and, the future. And to know about you know, hundreds of different of products unforeseen and exposures. Exactly. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and it, it, it creates a, you know, a difficult space for brokers, in my opinion. Um, so, the, so the point I'm trying to, to make is that brokers need to ensure that the level of cover they're procuring is adequate to cover these exposures that they, that they face. Right. And I, and I think probably the spotlight will be on records of advice, no. and as, as has been over, no. over the last few years. Yeah, there's been uh, a couple of positive uh, rulings in, in the courts recently um, that basically does show, you know, there must be negligence and that type of thing for brokers. The problem is, you know, the cost to get to that point. No, the mm. defense costs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, insurers also grappling with these systemic exposures in that insurers are exposed to multiple policies uh, responding to a single event, creating accumulation concerns from an insurer perspective. So we too have our challenges in dealing with these We're issues. going to chat to CISWARE just after this about the cyber, and, and I know that that certainly be one of the most difficult to arrange proper accumulation cover, mm. where you could have a thousand clients kind of being hit in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an event, maybe not a single mm. event, but, but a, a sort of a virus or ransomware attack. Um, so yeah, point taken. Um, I, I really, really don't like um, putting up uh, stats like this because it does imply that, you know, that things are going wrong in, in the professional services space. Um, so so we, we interviewed um, about 200 professionals um, who were not clients of SHA, and then we interviewed about 140 who were actually already clients. So, so it was quite a big pool of professionals that we spent, the largest pool actually that we've ever had. Um, and this was, the, this was the response that came back. So, so more than half of the professionals said that they've noticed a drop in the standard of graduates who are arriving you know, to, to work with them. 48%, um, a huge number, 
um, said that they'd lost senior staff who'd actually emigrated to other countries for, for better opportunities. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, an issue kind of separate from these two. Maybe we can talk about the first two before we get to the, the, the scope uh, issues. Um, what, what, what is the impact here on, on, on PR, Malcolm? You know, Simon, I mean, I mean, this seems to be consistent with previous surveys that we've done, yeah. where an alarmingly high percentage of our respondents indicated that there's a drop of standards of graduates coming through tertiary institutions. And coupled with a high number of senior experienced professionals exiting due to emigration um, is, a, is, is a concern. You know, we need it's these... like a perfect storm of stuff there, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we need these highly skilled um, professions to transfer skills to these junior uh, mm. professionals coming out of tertiary institutions because they don't have the practical know-how when practicing their, their profession or going into practice. Um, and we're starting to see that in claims as well, you know, where large projects or appointments are delegated to um, junior professionals without the proper supervision or adequate supervision. Juniors make critical mistakes in the execution of their services, which a senior, well-skilled professional would not have made, you know, thus avoiding claims. And we're losing that. So we're seeing this massive gap between junior professionals coming into the profession and senior professionals exiting without transferring these skills um, to close that gap. Yeah, so I mean, one of the reasons why we published the survey and, and we'll continue to talk about these points going forward um, is because we believe that as an industry and with, with our brokers, we have to work with clients um, to try and find solutions to these problems. Uh, I think Ian Fur will be talking a little bit about this um, in, in his session a bit later. But, but it, is, it, it is very worrying. Um, I mean, you certainly, we, we don't really do medical malpractice anymore, but, but you certainly wouldn't want this to be the case mm. in, in the medical fraternity. And, and why should it be any different for attorneys and engineers and often where there are lots of safety critical things that could go wrong? Um, so I think that, that that definitely requires ongoing conversation. Um, a third, uh, just coming back to the architects that we were talking mm. about, a third of the respondents said that, that they were pressured by their clients or I suppose just economic pressure to take on work outside of their normal scope. Uh, risks related to that, Malcolm? I mean, we see that as a result of a depressed economy, that firms are forced to take on additional work outside of their normal scope just to keep their staff employed. And the risk yeah. is that if they don't inform the insurers timelessly of this additional scope, um, and not allowing the insurer to appreciate the risk and, 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 and charge an appropriate rate for the risk, you know, they run the risk of not having Absolutely. a claim covered in the event that a claim emanates from the scope that's outside of their normal services. Not to mention that they just might not have the skills to, to deliver that professional service. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. Or the resources. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, um, let's move on here. Um, <laughs> again, mm. I mean, it's, we, we use different icons so that we don't get bored with reporting on the same <laughs> stat every year. Um, but this is just an ongoing story that we have across all of our lines of business. 38% um, of professionals saying they don't enter into legally binding contracts with their clients. And then on the right-hand side, 20% uh, not really having anything in place for recording negligence mm -hmm. uh, issues. Um, Anton, let me, let me ask you, uh, talking about not having a system in place for recording incidents, how does that create problems for us? Ooh, Simon, I think it creates problems for everyone, um, including the insureds, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, uh, like I mentioned, these matters are rather complex. And if something goes unnoticed or is attempted to, to, to sort it out themselves or between parties or whatever, you know, yes, sometimes one out of ten, you get lucky yeah. and you get it sorted out. Nine times out of ten, two years down the line, Everyone's so angry. Everyone's got four sets of attorneys, and no one wants to settle. No one wants to talk. No one wants to just move forward. So then it's a huge fight. So it, it becomes a nightmare to try and unravel a situation like that, you know, a year or two down the line. Whereas if, if it's noticed immediately, everyone can start working on it immediately. Mm. And then it's a lot easier to sort out a problem when it's this big versus trying to sort out a problem when it's 
you know, exploded already. I should point out, sorry, Malcolm, before you, before you comment there, that uh, the viewers might be thinking this is an SME issue. Um, this actually came out of our corporate PI mm -hmm. survey where, where the practices were quite big. Sorry, yeah. Malcolm. Yeah. I, I just want to mention that the other risk they face in not having a proper system to record uh, negligence incidents is that they could fall foul of not advising or notifying the insurer timelessly Correct. and may fall foul yeah. of late notification provisions on, on a policy yeah. and yeah. thus you know, having their claim potentially yeah. Please, please see attached judgment with notification <laughs> of claim. Mm. Well, we get that often. <laughs> the contractual issue? So, yeah, I mean, it, the study is really concerning. I mean, to think that in this day and age, in a landscape that is highly litigious, yeah. that professionals don't enter into legally binding contracts with their clients. I mean, a contract by its very nature sets out the respective parties' rights, duties, and obligations um, in the execution of the services. And it becomes difficult for us as insurers to defend an insured when there's no contract in place and where he feels he's not negligent. We face an uphill battle, um, sure. you know, in the absence of a contract. So it's, it's, it's absolutely critical that before an appointment is agreed upon or accepted that a, you know, a legally binding written contract um, is signed by both parties, it, it acceptable strikes, to both parties. I mean, it strikes me that oh, the two of you are, are, are attorneys, so, so correct me here if I'm wrong, but, but if uh, we, we saw this trend when we had our general liability chat with Manisha last week, and she, she pointed out the same thing. She said this is an issue. Now, in those instances on the, on the liability side, um, I guess it just reverts to a, a common law type position. That, that's what we, we, we were defending the insured on that basis because there's no contract. <laughs> but in the professional space, I'm assuming because you're talking about a professional versus just an ordinary person, not a professional, that the odds are automatically stacked against the professional because mm -hmm. they're the one perceived to have all the knowledge. Correct. So and without a contract, uh, That's why they're appointed in the first place. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't need to appoint an engineer or an attorney. Yeah. Or I'm relying you know, on you to that's why you give here. me the advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. Ab absolutely. Um, I, I think the other thing that I can just also mention, um, quite a substantial amount of claims uh, in the 2020 period followed from a scenario where uh, people had contracts and then there were lots of variations done two three four years during the contract period oh. okay and those the were house, never recorded the contract the jack built <laughs> correct <laughs> nobody checking it in between making sure one part talks to another yeah and and that's exactly the concern because we've seen on a number of occasions that the parties also do change during the period yeah. you know whether the, the client sells off the business to someone else or whether there's a new contract or whether a contract goes in business rescue and then all of a sudden you've got new people in and there's one contract that says, you know, you will build a house. And meantime, down the line, you know, someone expected a castle. Mm -hmm. It's that type of scenario. So the contracts must continue. That's what see. happened to Jacob Zuma. Kinda. He just wanted a little house, landed up with that. So <laughs> and a fire pool. <laughs> so um, on, on that note, um, it brings us to the end of the PR segment. So, so Malcolm, from you, um, any, any last words that you'd like to leave our, our audience with? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing a sharp rise in impersonator fraud type claims and by email scams. Uh, so our advice is that brokers need to ensure that their clients who are exposed to the, these type of claims have proper risk management systems in place to avoid these claims. And where they do have cover in place, to ensure that they have the correct level of cover, or an acceptable level of cover. I mean, we had a recent claim where an employee of an attorney misappropriated almost 11 million rand uh, from the trust account, and the attorney only had 2 million rand worth of cover. Wow. And this could be devastating for the attorney because he's still liable for Absolutely. the balance of the claim. So appropriate levels of cover is, is, is um, the point that I want to make okay. um, um, Great. as we leave. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Malcolm. Anton, anything from you? Simon, from our side, I think just once again, the, the, the contracts, you know, the contract certainty. I mean, that is something that, that we see regularly throughout most of the casualty business. You know, make sure there's a contract in place. You know, it's, 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 it's very difficult to try and protect your client's interests. Mm -hmm. We, everyone understands that they weren't liable, but the contract doesn't mm -hmm. speak to these specific duties and responsibilities. Absolutely something that, that everyone needs to keep in mind. Right, well, thank you. Malcolm, thanks for joining us. Anton, you're going to stick you. around with me. Yep.
Um, we'll be right back uh, with our cyber chat.